been examining the annual motion of the Earth going around the Sun, which causes the Sun to move through the wheel of the zodiac. And as it goes through the year, the Sun's path arcs higher and higher as it approaches the summer solstice. And then there are two crossing points the crossing point of the September equinox when the ecliptic path crosses the celestial equator and the nights take over and begin to be longer than the days on the way all the way down to the winter solstice and then the sun begins to climb back up towards the summer solstice again and reaches another crossing point the important crossing point of the spring equinox when the days once again take over and start to become longer than the nights on the way all the way up to the summer solstice. So we've examined the fact that these very important parts of the year are encoded in the myths around the world in different ways but with a common pattern that can be found on all the different continents in fact. And one of these patterns that's very important to understand is that the crossing points are often represented by sacrifices. Now these crossing points fit into the larger metaphor that the upper half of the year is the celestial, the heavenly, the spirit world, and the lower half is the world of water and earth, the world of clay, the world of the material, the world of the incarnation. So these two crossing points are very important points because that is the point that the spirit world and the material world intersect and they are depicted in myths around the world with some common patterns one of which is the sacrifice pattern and we looked at the sacrifice of Isaac which is on the upward half of the year because in the story Abraham is going up the mountain and so this is the spring equinox crossing point and we saw that there is a clue, a celestial clue, the zodiac sign of the ram plays a part in that sacrifice story. So it's not a literal sacrifice, it's not even a literal mountain that they are going up. It is a metaphorical mountain and it has a spiritual and esoteric spiritual message that it's conveying that we'll examine in a bit more depth towards the end half of this video. So let's take a look at one more example from the Old Testament scriptures to show that this is not a, uh, you know, a, just a, an accidental connection that we're drawing with the sacrifice of Isaac. And we're going to now look at the other half, the other crossing point, the crossing point on the way down, the one that is in the sign of Virgo, and that is the story of Jephthah's daughter. And you can read this uh, episode in the book of Judges in chapter 11. You can read about Jephthah and how the elders of Israel asked him to lead the forces in battle against the children of Ammon, the Ammonites. And he does so. And in verse 30, I'm going to skip ahead to verse 30, where Jephthah, we're told, And Jephthah vowed a vow unto the Lord and said, if thou shalt without fail deliver the children of Ammon into mine hands, then it shall be that whatsoever cometh forth of the doors of my house to meet me when I return in peace from the children of Ammon shall surely be the Lord's, and I will offer it up for a burnt offering. So Jephthah passed over unto the children of Ammon to fight against them, and the Lord delivered them into his hands, and he smote them. I'm going to skip ahead to uh, verse 34. And Jephthah came to Mizpah unto his house, and behold, his daughter came out to meet him with timbrels and with dances, and she was his only child. Beside her he had neither son nor daughter. And it came to pass when he saw her that he rent his clothes and said, Alas, my daughter, thou hast brought me very low, and thou art one of them that trouble me, for I have opened my mouth unto the Lord and I cannot go back. And she said unto him, My father, if thou hast opened my, thy mouth unto the Lord, do to me 
according to that which hath proceeded out of thy mouth, for as much as the Lord hath taken vengeance for thee of thine enemies, even of the children of Ammon. And she said unto her father, Let this thing be done for me. Let me alone two months, that I may go up and down upon the mountains. That's the, this is the King James translation, the 1611 translation. It says, Let me alone two months, that I may go up and down upon the mountains. But there's a gloss, there's a footnote that says that the Hebrew actually says, Go and go down. So really it says, let me alone two months that I may go and go down upon the mountains. That didn't seem to make much sense apparently to the translators, so they said that I may go up and down upon the mountains. But really, this is talking about going down the mountain. And, and then she says that I may go and go down upon the mountains and bewail my virginity, I and my fellows. And he said, go. And he sent her away for two months, and she went with her companions and bewailed her virginity upon the mountains. And it came to pass at the end of two months that she returned unto her father who did with her according to his vow which he had vowed, and she knew no man. And it was a custom in Israel that the daughters of Israel went yearly to lament the daughter of Jephthah the Gileadite four days in a year. Now some literalists, obviously this puts those who want to take a literalist interpretation in quite a bind. This is a horrifying story. But I would argue that this is not meant to be taken literally at all. It causes tremendous problems if you try to take it literally. But all the clues are present that we are talking about a celestial metaphor and one that has to do with the constellation Virgo. First of all, we've already talked about the going up for the um, sacrifice of Isaac. And that is on the spring equinox when the sun is ascending towards the summer solstice. In this passage, very clearly, we're told that she goes down the mountain, and that's indicating which side of the zodiac wheel we're on. Second of all, um, the virginity is mentioned several times. Now, some literalists take this to mean that he didn't actually uh, sacrifice his daughter. He uh, consigned her to the uh, basically the priesthood or to be in the temple and to basically be in a, a cloistered environment and and she didn't actually die. That, that really is better that she wasn't killed, but it's still a violation of, of her personal freedom because of his rash vow. It's still problematic, but I would argue that this emphasis on virginity is because we're talking about the constellation Virgo. And there's one more very um, strong clue about that. There's a couple more clues, but one is the fact that she's playing a timbrel when um, she dances out to meet her father, and he uh, is horrified to see that she's the first thing that has come out of the doors of his house that now he has to sacrifice. But she's playing a timbrel, and she's dancing, and that's a tambourine. And in fact, the constellation Virgo, we've talked about the fact that the constellation itself has an outstretched arm, a distinctive outstretched arm, but above that outstretched arm, there's actually a kind of a circle of faint stars that has been interpreted in various ways, in various myths, but often to be some kind of a circular uh, thing that, that this, um, whoever the, the myth that's embodying the constellation Virgo is holding. Sometimes it's a mirror, sometimes it's a bowl or a dish of water, and sometimes it's kind of a circular instrument, we're not sure what it is and sometimes it's a timbrel, which is to say a tambourine, and that's what Jephthah's daughter is holding. There's a few more clues. One is the fact that Jephthah was actually fighting the Ammonites, which I believe has to do with the upper half of the circle. So when he comes back, this is he's, he's finished the upper half of the circle. Another clue is the fact that it's a burnt offering. Um, there's often imagery of fire at each of the two, equinoxes, and that's because that is where the fiery path of the sun, the ecliptic, crosses the celestial equator. I'm not going to really go into depth on those. I believe there's enough clues to establish the fact that this story, just like the Isaac and Abraham story, has to do with a celestial metaphor, has to do with this annual motion of the year. And so our examination of these crossing points and the fact that they are 
related to the equinoxes and the crossing of those two important transition points in the year brings us to one more very important crossing that we have to examine before we can really draw out the, the spiritual uh, message, which is actually a very beautiful, profound, and uplifting spiritual message that these stories are conveying. You see, the, the story of Jephthah's daughter, taken literally, is horrible. But this is metaphorically talking about the annual circuit of the year, and that in itself is conveying a much deeper spiritual metaphor. This isn't all about the passage throughout the year. The passage throughout the year is being used to convey a spiritual message, which is an uplifting message, I believe. And, and we'll get to that in the next video, actually, because it's to do justice to this one more crossing that we have to examine. It's going to um, require a little bit of examination because we're going to take a look at the crossing of the Red Sea and Moses leading the children of Israel across the Red Sea. And once we take a look at that one more crossing, then we'll be able to really draw out this um, spiritual metaphor that is being established. So please join me in part five of this video series where we'll pick up, we're kind of stopping in midstream, so to speak, and we'll pick up with the crossing of the Red Sea and finish off the uh, theme that we're building towards here and, and examine some of the spiritual truths that I believe are being conveyed by all of these crossings. Mm -hmm.